Life Media, America's leading source for life improvement, presents Jim Rohn, Living an Exceptional Life. Hey, thank you. How's everybody? Nice to see you. Thanks for coming today. I appreciate it very much, and uh, I'm just delighted to be here. How many of you have never seen me before? This is your first time. Wow, everybody. <laughs> I keep thinking I'm famous, but I guess, you know, that settles that. Anyway, nice to see you. I've got some interesting ideas to share with you. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. ready. And if you'll take some good notes, I've got some lists for you to make that you can take home with you and ponder at later times, some of the things I want to share with you. I was raised in southwest Idaho. My parents gave me an incredibly excellent start in my life, which I appreciated very much. But I quit school at age 19, unfortunately. My reasoning was, I'm smart enough to get a job. How much smarter do you need to be? And with that shallow thinking, I quit school, age 19, and got a job, went to work. A little while later, got married, started a little family, and I'm struggling and, you know, trying to do my best. But it seems like each year I'm falling just a little bit further behind. Finally, age 25, the climax of my sort of you know, weariness with where I was, not doing as well as I thought I should, I hear a knock on my door, and I happen to be home alone. When I opened the door, there was a little Girl Scout about this tall selling Girl Scout cookies. And she gave me the finest sales presentation I've ever heard, Girl Scouts around the world, no better organization, and we've got these cookies, only $2, several flavors, and with a big smile, she very politely asked me to buy. No problem, I wanted to buy. Big problem, I haven't got $2 in my pocket. Now I'm a grown man, I live in America, I've been to one year of college, I'm married, I've got a family, and I don't have $2 in my pocket. And I didn't want to tell her that. So I did what I thought was next best. I lied to her. I said, hey, look, I've already bought lots of Girl Scout cookies. I've still got plenty in the house that we haven't eaten yet. And she said, oh, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. And she leaves. When she leaves, I say to myself, I don't want to live like this anymore. I mean, how low can you get lying to a Girl Scout? I mean, <laughs> that's about as low as you can go. But I promised myself that day I was going to start my search of finding opportunity, finding somebody who could teach me and coach me on doing much better for myself and for my family and for my future. And shortly after that, I met a most extraordinary man, very wealthy, but um, a friend of mine said, you've got to meet this man. He's rich, but he's easy to talk to. He's got a unique philosophy of business and life. And the more he told me about this man, the more I said, I've got to meet this guy. And shortly after that, I had a chance to meet him. Sure enough, uh, when I met him, I was impressed. Obviously, he was rich. But he was friendly and easy to talk to. And I said to myself, if I could just get around someone like him, and if he would coach me, I would be willing to learn anything. I'd love to be like him. Well, my good fortune was he invited me to join his company and over the next five years, my dream came true. He coached me and taught me how to turn my life from pennies to fortune. And he's not alive anymore, but uh, I'd like to pay tribute to him one more time, Mr. Earl Schof, for the dramatic impact he had on my life, especially during that five-year period. And so my whole life turned around I made my fortune by the time I was 32, starting at age 25. And uh, some of the ideas that I want to share with you today came from that five-year experience. Then from there, I got into lecturing and giving seminars, and I've written a few books. 
and uh, my career now spans about 41 years. But I'll never forget the impact this gentleman had on my life with a few simple concepts that totally changed my life, changed my future, and changed everything. Jim Rohn's view of the 21st century. Here's number one, unprecedented opportunity. We not only have begun a new century, century 21, it's a new millennium. A millennium is a thousand year period. We've had six so far. This is the beginning of the seventh millennium and some scholars tell us that this could very well be an extraordinary time for the human race, this seventh millennium. And there's probably a lot of good reason that that is probably true. Unprecedented opportunity. Uh, we've now got the technology. Uh, we pick up a telephone now and talk to somebody on the other side of the world. Transportation now is so easy. I get on an airplane in Los Angeles and uh, 13 hours later, I'm in Tokyo. Uh, five meals, three movies, and you're there. I mean, you know, it's a simple deal. Anyway, we've got technology, we've got transportation, we've got all the rest, right? So this is gonna be a time of unprecedented opportunity in every field you can imagine, every industry, every country, it's gonna be the greatest period of opportunity time in the history of the human race, the 21st century, especially these opening years of the 21st century. So that's number one, unprecedented opportunity. Now here's the second note to take. Now also keen competition, because we now play the world game. And it's not just competition across the street and company to company and you know division to division and uh, you know, company to company. Now it's worldwide competition. A job now becomes available. Does it go to someone in Minnesota or someone in India? Worldwide competition. So now you've got to be ready to cash in on the opportunity, but you've also got to be ready for the competition. So I've got some interesting ideas on how to be prepared for both opportunity and competition in these opening years of the 21st century. Here's some of my best advice. Number one, you've got to have more than one skill. It's okay to have one skill, but I'm telling you, if you want economic safety for the future, especially this century, my personal opinion, you need more than one skill. We've seen people, right, the last uh, 15, 20 years that only had one skill, worked for this company for a long time, the division the guy worked for got chopped, eliminated, now he loses his job. Now he tells us he's in economic distress. Why would that be? Simple answer, he only had one skill. So for economic safety for the future, my personal advice, you gotta have more than one skill. In fact, it led me to my first fortune and that was learning more than one skill. I started learning these extra skills in Idaho, where I grew up. I knew how to milk cows, but it didn't pay very well. Then someone gave me this incredible advice. If you want to lay the foundation for a future fortune, you've got to learn more than one skill. And I started that process age 25. Here's the first one, and I started part-time, a little sales job that I got a product that I believed in, learned how to present it well enough for somebody to say yes, gave excellent service so that that would lead to multiple sales, and this little extra part-time job in sales absolutely started multiplying my income. From milk and cows, now I've got this ability now to start getting customers, keep them serviced, and make some money in this extra skill. So now I've got two skills milking cows and finding customers. Here's the next skill I learned, just to give you a quick list. Next was finding good people. If you've got a little enterprise going and you need some people, you have to just go look for them. And when I learned this skill, finding good people for my little enterprise, I couldn't believe how it drastically changed my income. My income now starts to multiply, not just increase. So now I've got what? Three skills, milking cows, getting customers, finding good people. I'm on my way. Here's the next one that paid me big money, in case you're interested, and that's organizing. 
Organizing simply means getting people to work together. Big challenge, but if you learn the skill, getting people to work together, they pay extraordinary money. Here's the next one that really increased my income substantially, and that's promotion and recognition. Rewarding people for small steps of progress. I mastered this one. And here's the philosophy behind it. Be so busy giving other people recognition you really don't need it for yourself. I mastered this. Guess what it pays? Big money. Let me just give you one more, and it's in three parts. And that's communication. Learning to affect other people with your language. Of all the things not to be lazy about, it's language, because words can work miracles. And communication I found in three parts. Here's number one, training. Showing somebody how the job works. Showing somebody how the business works. We call that training. I got good at that. Paid big money. Here was the next one, teaching. Teaching people how life works. Teaching people how to set goals. Teaching how to become a leader, manager, entrepreneur. Stepping up to the higher opportunity and better challenge. This one paid me extraordinary money. But this one paid the best, learning to inspire. Helping people to see themselves better than they are. So I've got how many skills, right? A big long list. So safety, economic safety for the future, especially the opening years of the 21st century. Learn more than one skill. Here's number two. It would be good to learn more than one language. Some of my business colleagues who uh, speak three or four languages earn three, four million dollars a year. One of my friends, Leon Weisbein from Russia. I remember when he was making three million dollars a year, he spoke three languages. Here's what he said, I think I'll learn another language, make another million dollars. Those extra languages are so valuable. When I travel the world, I gotta find somebody that knows more than one language or I'm in deep trouble. If you think the time has passed you by to learn that second, third language, make this note. You heard it from Jim Rohn. Give it as a gift to your children. The second language. Maybe that'll inspire them to learn the third language and then no telling where it might go from there. I asked a school teacher one time, how many languages can a child learn? Here's what she said. As many as you will teach them. They don't lack capacity. They don't lack intelligence. They certainly don't lack curiosity. They only lack a teacher. So you got my good advice now? More than one skill, more than one language. Here's the rest. Learn the simple economic formula that works for everybody, and I can give it to you in just a couple of sentences. A simple economic formula, kids can understand it, anybody can understand it. Anybody that wants to get paid, here's the language for your notes. We get paid for bringing value to the marketplace. That's as simple as you can put economics. Anybody that wants to get paid, you get paid for bringing value to the marketplace. The marketplace is the people. Now, the value we bring is one part of it, a product or a service, but here's the other part, the value you become. So just off to the side put, the value is two parts. The value you bring, like a product, if you manufactured it, you might keep improving the product. If someone else manufactured it and you're out selling it, they probably keep improving the product. But this is the one you have to work on yourself. The value you become, like an entrepreneur, a leader, a teacher, supervisor, manager. What you become also pays much more than what you bring. Once I understood that, then here's what my mentor said. Go to work on yourself harder than you work on your job. If you work hard on your job, you can make a living. Then he said, if you work hard on yourself, you could make a fortune. 
So I worked hard on my job and made a living, but I learned, starting with those extra hours per week, learning these extra skills, I started working on myself. And here's a philosophical phrase everybody should take home. Here it is. Success is something you attract by becoming an attractive person. Success is not something you pursue. It's what you attract by becoming attractive. By becoming attractive to the marketplace. What would do that? Multiple skills, multiple languages, and then some of the things I'm going to talk about the rest of the seminar. So, now what else would help you to be attractive to the marketplace besides more than one skill and more than one languages? I've divided it into five. Five simple, basic fundamentals of ideas to ponder and think about that will increase your value to the marketplace could perhaps, like it did for me, multiply your income by two and then multiply it by three, and then multiply your income by four, and then by five, and once you get there, it's not that difficult to multiply it by 10, because all you have to do is make sure you become more valuable and more valuable and more valuable. You don't have to work on the economy, because here's the first note. Each person's income is determined primarily by their philosophy not by the economy. Once I understood that, then I said, well, I don't have to go to work on the economy. And the answer was no. You only have to go to work on yourself to make yourself more valuable. So now here's five things I want to share with you. And the first one is your personal philosophy. What could get you more prepared and ready for cashing in on the opportunity of the 21st century and here's the first one, personal philosophy. Your personal philosophy is like a guidance system that helps you make decisions what to do, what not to do. From the information you get and what you learn and what you know, we decide. Maybe your philosophy would have been uh, five years ago never to attend seminars like this. You just didn't go. Now, five years later, here you are. Something happened along the way to change your mindset saying, hey, for the money and the time, if I just get one good idea and walk away, it certainly is worth the money and the time. So now, that little amendment in your philosophy, you now say, I'm going to regularly go. Because it doesn't take but a few ideas to make a great difference in your income, personal life, social life, and all the rest. So now, you know that's valuable. A change of mind, a change of idea. So that's what personal philosophy is all about. The more we learn, the more we know, the better we're able to make better decisions about two major things. Your philosophical guidance system does two things. For your notes, number one, helps you to see the dangers on one side so you can avoid those. But here's what else your guidance system does. Personal philosophy. Helps you to see the opportunities on the other side so that you can expand those, maximize those. And here's what that's called. The game of life is to minimize the dangers and maximize the opportunities. And the more we know and the more we learn, the more experience we gather in sessions like this, from the sermon on Sunday morning to the books we read and all the rest, helps us to keep continually adjusting our philosophical guidance system so that we minimize more dangers, maximize more opportunities. That's really the game of life. I couldn't put it much more simply. So number one, we're affected by what we know. Now how do we know more things and learn more things that'll help us readjust our thinking so we can avoid the dangers, maximize the opportunities? Here's number one, learn from personal experience. One way to learn to do something right is what? First do it wrong, right? Mess up and then you say, wow, that was costly. I'm never going to do that again. So one way to learn to do it right, first do it wrong. Sometimes a negative experience turns out finally to be positive. They say if you survive your first heart attack, you may now live to be a very old person. Why is that? Well, that first heart attack, if you survived it, is called a wake-up 
call. And maybe the doctor said, one more of these and you're history. And you said, wow. And you make it for the health food store. And you start reading every book you can find on good nutrition, how to avoid another one of these heart attacks. And you start jogging and start walking and doing all of the stuff. And this total change of lifestyle could now save your life and cause you to live to be a very old person. Here's what my mentor said that's some of the best advice I ever got. He said, Mr. Rohn, if you will change, everything will change for you. If you'll start making personal changes, your income will change, your health will change, your future will change, everything will change if you're willing to start making the changes. So sometimes a negative experience now causes us to really make a sudden shift in our philosophical guidance system that says, hey, I'm never going to let this happen to me again. Fantastic. Now here's the next way to learn, and that is to learn from other people's experiences, whether they are negative or positive. It's too bad failures don't give seminars like this. Wouldn't that be good information? Now, we don't want to pay them so they don't lecture. So. But their information would be valuable. If you know a guy that's messed up his life for 40 years, you have to say, John, would you spend a day with me? And I will bring my notebook and take good notes. A good-looking guy like you, beautiful family, every reason to do well, threw it all away. Teach me how for the last 40 years you messed it all up. And he tells you, and you take good notes. Learning from the negative side of someone's experience. If somebody tells me these eggs are rotten, I'm not going to make an omelet and try it, right? I'm just going to take their advice and their know-how. So. Learn number one from your own experiences. Learn number two from other people's experiences. And my mentor taught me to all keep a journal. Here's what he said. Don't trust your memory. If you want to live a dynamic life, multiplying your income, multiplying your future, be a good student. If a good idea comes your way, write it down. Then ponder it. Then perhaps go do it. Okay. Now. Your philosophy comes from what you learn, comes from what you know, comes from other people's experiences. Three ways now to learn from other people. Here's number one, learn from what you see. One of the great watchwords of these early years of the 21st century, pay attention. If you just watch, you can pick up clues. Success leaves clues. And if you'll be a better observer, of the winners and the losers, those that are doing well and those that are falling behind. And just take mental notes and good notes and say, I'm going to adjust to what I'm doing based on what I see. Here's number two. We learn so much from other people based on what we hear. Here's good advice on that. Be a selective listener. Listen to voices of value that have experience, ideas, reputation, something valuable to share. Now here's number three, read all the books. Now there's millions of books, so you can't read all the books. But make this note, read all the books you need to read to make you as wealthy as you want to be, as healthy as you want to be, as prosperous, as productive, as unique a human being as you want to be. Read all of those books. Don't leave those books go unread. My mentor got me started on my library when I was 25. I got one of the best. If you saw my library, you would be impressed. I haven't read everything in it, but I feel smarter just walking in it, right? <laughs> my library. I was smart enough to buy it all. Now I got to be smart enough to read it all. Now jot this down. When you do read, you have to sort through what you read and decide which is valuable to try. That's part of the process of learning. Gathering information and sorting through it. One, the information that would apply to you and what you think would be valuable based on your current philosophical opinion. So read all the books. Our lives are greatly affected by what we learn and what we know. Now here's number two of these very basic five things I want to share with you. First, your personal philosophy. Here's number two, your attitude. 
First, we're affected by what we know. When I talk to the kids in high school classes, college classes, that's the first thing I tell them. Get the information while you're here. Right? Nothing worse than being stupid when you get out of school. So get the information. Being broke is bad, but being stupid is what's really bad. And what's really, really bad is being broke and stupid. <laughs> Nothing much worse than that, unless you're sick. Right? Sick, broken, stupid. That's about as far as you can fall unless you're ugly. Right? <laughs> but surely that would be the ultimate, right? The ultimate negative life. Ugly, sick, broken, stupid. So learn all you can. We're, life, we're affected by what we know, so get the information. Don't be lazy in learning. Don't be lazy in going through the books, building your library, coming to classes like this consistently, consistently. Some of them will be so dramatic, your life will never be the same. Maybe this is one of those today. Next, we're affected by how we feel, attitude. This is the emotional part. We need the intellectual part to set sail. So as the winds blow, we can still get where we want to go. Redefine, keep strengthening our psychological and philosophical guidance system. But now we're also affected by the emotions. That's the power. And jot these notes down as I hurry along now. Four things to consider on attitude and how you feel. Here's number one. It's how you feel about the past. It's important to make the past useful. Past experience, even past losses, past failures, as well as successes. To review it and go back over it, see where you went wrong, correct that, invest that now in the future. Don't live in the past, and don't carry the past around like a burden, but simply use your past as one of your mentors to help refine mistakes, make some changes that you can invest now in the future. Here's the second attitude. It's how you feel about the future. We look back for experience. But number two, we look forward for inspiration. Now, where does the inspiration come from? Looking forward. Here it is, learning to set goals. Number one, decide what you want. Takes more than five minutes. Take some time and decide what you want. Where do you want to go? What do you want to do the next 10 years, 20 years? What would you like to become? How many skills would you like to learn? What are the books you want to read? How about the people you want to meet? The cities you want to visit? Experiences you'd like to have over this next period of time? Start thinking about all of that. Here's the next key. Write it all down. Building a life is like building a house. You wouldn't start building the house until you had it finished. Wouldn't you look foolish starting to build the house if it wasn't finished first? What if you were laying bricks and somebody came by and said, what are you building here? And you said, I have no idea. <laughs> See, they would take you away to a safe place. <laughs> so building a life is a lot more important than building a house. And yet people treat it, treat it so carelessly and so casually about planning and making plans for what they want their life to work out to be. So I'm asking you not to be casual anymore. Start designing the future for yourself, for your family, for your business, for your future. Okay, decide what you want. Okay, so from the past we get experience, from the future we get excitement, inspiration by setting goals. Now here's the next advice. Put everything on your list of goals, little things, insignificant to someone else but important to you. A goal list is important. You don't have to publish it in the local newspaper. My Japanese friend, Toro Ikeda, San Jose, California, put on his first list, a Caucasian gardener. I said, go Toro. Back then, everybody had a Japanese gardener. He said, no, I'm Japanese. I want a Caucasian gardener. I like that. So set goals. Set the goals that'll turn you on, goals that'll get you excited. Put everything on your list. Now, here's the next attitude. It's very important how you feel about everybody. If you want to be a leader extraordinaire, here's what you learn. Each of us need all of us. One person doesn't make an economy. One person doesn't make a symphony orchestra. It takes all of us for each of us to be successful. Each of us need all of us and all of us need each of us. Each gift is important. 
as we bring it to the table, as we bring it to the country, as we bring it to the community. Learn to appreciate that. Each of us need all of us. Now here's the last one on attitude. It's how you feel about yourself. Nothing more powerful than self-confidence to start multiplying your income by two, by three, by five, by 10. And where does that come from? Make the note. It comes from self-esteem. Doing the things you know you should do and at the end of this day, your self-esteem is soaring and high. You've met the people you said you'd meet. You made the calls you said you would make. You did the things that you required of yourself to do. And at the end of the day, you feel great about yourself. That is one of the greatest motivating factors for the future, self-esteem, feeling good about yourself. Now let me give you the miracle piece of this formula. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. Here it is. Number three is activity. We're affected by what we do. Now we've gotten to the formula of how to turn ideas into reality, how to turn imagination into substance. It's called number three, activity. So add these notes to it now. Activity is the work. Activity is the labor. You might add labor pains. I'm short on personal experience here, but the mothers in the room would tell us that we know what that's all about, labor pains. Why would an upcoming potential mother be willing to put herself through maybe a rather painful experience? She said, that's an easy answer, and it's for your notes. It produces new life. Why wouldn't she put herself to the labor? Now comes the miracle of new life. And whether it's new career life or new business life or new friendship life or new married life or new life of any kind, it has to come from the work. It comes from the labor. In fact, labor was so important, here was the original formula for labor. If you have forgotten it, remind yourself for your notes. Six days of labor and what? One day of rest. Now, it's important not to get those numbers mixed up. Why is that? Here's why. Why not five, two? I don't know. Maybe five and two would be okay. If God would have thought of five and two, he might have made it five and two. But you can't think of everything when you're putting one of these together. <laughs> but maybe one of the reasons for six, one, jot this down now. If you rest too long, the weeds take the garden. Not to think so is naive. As soon as you've planted, the busy bugs and the noxious weeds are out to take it. So you can't linger too long in the rest mode. You've got to go back to work. Six days of work, then rest and spirituality and friendship and change of pace. And then go back over the last six days. What did I do? What did I miss? Who did I miss? What happened? So that I can invest those corrections in the next six days of higher productivity. Have you got that now? Six days of work. One day of rest, don't get the numbers mixed up. Activity. Now, activity finishes the miracle. Good question for your notes. How did this convention center get here? Let me give you the steps. Number one, somebody saw it while the property was vacant. You say, well, how could you see a convention center if it isn't here? It's the only way it will be here. And somebody has to see it so clearly they can draw a picture of it, saying, this is the convention center. You say, no, it isn't there. They say, yes, this is the convention center. The artist rendering shows you a picture of what isn't there. That's the beginning of imagination. So to turn nothing into something, here's what you do. Imagine the possibilities. That's why we recommend testimonials for someone to say, hey, I started with pennies and I made a fortune. And when they finish, sometimes they say something like this. If I can do it, what? You can do it. And we start imagining the possibilities. Here's number two. Have faith to believe that some of them are possible for you. And both imagination and faith are powerful forces. But we still don't have a hotel. We still don't have a house. Even though those are powerful forces, it is the beginning. Now, imagination and faith must be deposited in activity or it is wasted. 
But the finishing touch of the miracle process is now go to work. Go to work and build a better career. Go to work and build good health. You can't have good health without the work. When did we start hearing that phrase? No pain, what? No gain. You got to do the work. You can read all the books until you're wise. You can have faith and believe until it is extraordinary. But now you must go to work. And if you'll learn to appreciate the work that produces the miracle of good health, the miracle of a career, the miracle of a relationship, the miracle of a fortune, only humans now can do this. The birds of the field can't do it. No other life form can imagine and create something from nothing. Have faith and then build it and make it real. Only humans. It's an extraordinary gift. Depends on how often you use it. So number one of the ideas I wanted to share with you to make this an extraordinary opening year century for you is philosophy. We're affected by what we know. Second is attitude. We're affected by how we feel. Third is activity. We're affected by what we do. Now here's the final two pieces. Number four, learn to measure progress. Once you've set up a project now, you want to turn nothing into something, now you must measure your progress. How are you doing? Here's how we teach it to our children. Life expects us to make measurable progress in reasonable time. Measurable progress in reasonable time. That is the game of life. So part of it is not just to set up the proposed project, but as we start working on it, we start measuring how we're doing. Now first, what is reasonable time? You can't ask someone every five minutes, how are you doing now? See, that's too soon. Guy says, I haven't left the building yet. Give me a break. Now we can't wait five years. That's too long. So there's reasonable time. So make this note now, what is reasonable time? One, at the end of the day. A conversation a father should have with his daughter today because the magic is there. If he waits till tomorrow, the magic may be gone. Today. Next is a week. Make that note. Usually, we get paid by the week. Somebody adds up our value to the marketplace, out comes the check. The next week, somebody adds up our value to the marketplace, out comes the check. What I learned to do is to change my value to the marketplace so the check kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I didn't have to change the economy. I only had to change myself. Measure your own progress. Success is a numbers game. We demanded of our children, how many years do you want your child to spend in fourth grade? Approximately. About one year, right? You say, well, if they're nice kids, would you give them three or four years? You say, no. This is not a nice game. This is getting ready for the future. This is getting ready for the challenges and the opportunities. You can't linger in one grade more than one year. Now make this note. The same should go for us as adults. Don't linger more than one year in one grade of learning. Adult, management, entrepreneurship, leaderships of all kind. Keep up the pace of learning. Okay. The numbers. Measure. Count. Now here's the key. Face the truth. If you're only making this much progress, you know, there's no use trying to kid the world, no use trying to kid anybody else, and especially don't kid yourself. If in a period of time you've only made so much progress, you just got to swallow hard and say, this is the truth. I've got to face it. Now, what could I do to start increasing my progress and make my health better, make my income better, make my investments better, make my value to the marketplace much better, get busy learning the second skill and the third skill and the next language and the next language to increase my value. I got to get busy and do that. See, if you will do that, I promise you, one of the greatest motivating factors in the world is progress. And if you'll measure it, you'll get excited. Now, here's number five of the five major things I wanted to share with you 
to make these opening years of the 21st century really pay off for you. And here's the word, lifestyle. Learning to live well, because the ultimate essence of life is not a Ferrari. The ultimate essence is not a home. The ultimate essence is not a bank account. It's not a million dollars. It's not a fortune. Here it is. The ultimate essence of life is learning to live a good life. That's the key. Whether you have modest resources or whether you have mega millions, either way, the real key is learning to live a good life. And so in my closing five minutes, let me give you what I think is a good list. Now, this is the short list. In other presentations, I cover a longer list, but this is called Jim Rohn's short list for living the good life. Here it is. Number one, productivity. You really won't be that happy if you don't produce. And here's the next bit of advice on that. Produce to the max if you possibly can. To produce a little is okay. To produce enough is okay. To produce some to get by is all right. But why not try productivity to the max? Andrew Carnegie, who built the steel industry back in the 30s, here's what Andrew said. I'm going to spend the first half of my life accumulating money. I'm going to spend the last half of my life giving it all away. He got so inspired by that goal that the first half of his life he accumulated $400 million, which back in the 30s was a lot of money. A mega fortune. Guess what he did the last half of his life? He gave it all away. I got a good question for, for you as we close. Here's the question. What's got you turned on? What's got you up early? What's got you eager to face the day? What's got you inspired to learn the extra skill, put in the extra time, go the extra mile, learn how to work with people, guarantee your future? Good question. Here's number two, good friends. You got to have good friends. The best support system in the world is good friends. Collect and nourish those as priceless. Good friends are those wonderful people who know all about you and still like you. Those are good friends. Here's number three, your heritage. What's made America so unique among all the nations of the world and the greatest experiment in the history of the world? And that is the depository of gifts that have come to America over the last three or four hundred years. The heritage from all walks of life all over the world. Now the key to keeping America vital and powerful and unique for generations to come is to keep alive these heritages. The music, the dance, the costume, the customs, the literature, the poetry and all the rest combined together making us an extraordinary, unusual nation among nations. Keep your heritage alive. Here's number four. Your spirituality. Whatever you believe in terms of spirituality, that's important. And I've got three words for you to consider. Here they are. Study, practice, and teach. Whatever you believe in terms of spirituality, study, practice, and teach. Don't leave your spirituality unstudied, don't leave it unpracticed, and don't leave it untaught. It's one of the major components of a good life. And now to close for your notes. Take special care of the inner circle. Family, close friends. Nourish them, they will nourish you. Inspire them, they will inspire you. And take care of the details, the little things that makes it special for family and friends. When my father was still alive, my mother died. My father lived about another seven, eight years. When I used to travel, I would try to call him while he was having breakfast with the farmers, southwest Idaho. 
make a special day. If I'm in Israel, I got to get up in the middle of the night. But I call in the middle of the night, Papa, I'm in Israel. And they would bring him the phone in this little cafe called the Decoy Inn. And Papa would say, Israel, son, how are things in Israel? And he'd talk real loud so everybody could hear. Right? Say, Papa, they gave me a reception last night on the rooftop overlooking the Mediterranean. He'd say, overlooking the Mediterranean. Now he's got a story to tell for the rest of the day. My son called me this morning while I was having breakfast with the farmers. I know he had to get up in the middle of the night. Special days. One more scene. I thought about my father walking down the lane on the farm to the mailbox, opening it up. And this is for your notes. Make sure the mailbox is not empty. My father lived to be 93. What kind of an experience would that be for a day? Age 93, open the mailbox and it's empty. Even if it's just a postcard. Make sure the mailbox is not empty. The details, the inner circle. And now here's the last. Maybe, just maybe, some of the things I've shared with you have been seeds that have fallen on your consciousness at the right time. And then if it turns into something valuable for you in the future, that will be well worth my coming, being away from my grandchildren and my children for a little while, to come and deposit the best of my experience with all of you today. Thank you very much. God bless.